Jews, Christians, and Muslims all trace their beginnings to one man, Abraham. He is considered the father of all three faiths, collectively known as Abrahamic religions. Abraham first appeared in the book of Genesis, and in Jewish tradition, Abraham is considered the first Jew. So we all share the idea that Abraham was uh, the first, in many ways, the first uh, for all of our traditions. We are descendants of Abraham, and the Dome of the Rock, uh, that place there, Har Hamoriah, as we say in Hebrew, uh, so Abraham was asked to bring Isaac for sacrifice. Under the Dome of the Rock, that's that gold dome with the beautiful blue mosaics. And uh, that stone is called the Foundation Stone. According to Jewish tradition, that stone was where the creation of, of the earth and the uh, creation process began. It was also the place where Abraham in the book of Genesis brings his son Isaac and is tested by God. Abraham's son, Isaac, would have a son named Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons founded the 12 tribes of Israel. Through Abraham, we really discovered in many ways uh, that God is one. Uh, through Abraham, we know that this, uh, his seed, his, his descendants, will eventually lead to the birth of the Messiah. In Christian tradition, God's promise to Abraham would be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Christians, like Jews and Muslims, are monotheistic. They believe in one God the primary belief of the three Abrahamic religions. My Islam that I learned from my family and our interpretation of our faith is that Christians and Jews are people of the book. They worship the same God of Abraham. They have equally valid pathways to God. In addition to the connection to Abraham, the three faiths believe a Messiah will someday appear. Yet they don't agree on the identity of the Savior. 4,000 years ago, God sent Moses to redeem the Israelites after more than 400 years of slavery in Egypt, leading them to the land that was promised to the descendants of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. On Mount Sinai, God gave the Jews the Torah. The Torah is quintessential uh, in its message for the Jew because it contains the commandments, a total of 613. And so the Torah is in a sense, the Constitution, the Jewish Constitution, telling us how to live. The word mitzvah is very important in Jewish life. It's a deed, meritorious deed. The first permanent place of worship for the Jews in Israel was a temple built by King David's son, Solomon, on Mount Moriah. This is the famous uh, mountain right in the center of Jerusalem, upon which the uh, first and second temples Jewish temples were built. King Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah 134 years later and the Babylonian Empire destroyed the temple. Cyrus the Great of Persia would re-establish the city of Jerusalem and the people of Israel built a second temple which became known as Herod's Temple. This second temple stood for 420 years until the Romans destroyed it in 70 AD. The lower level of the western wall is part of the surviving remains of Herod's complex it represents the holiest shrine of the Jewish world. Jews believe a descendant of David will someday return as the Messiah to restore the glory of Israel by building a third temple. So there are those who believe the Messianic period means an individual, a human. Descendant of the uh, David line will come will bring about a transformation in the world. Today, the Temple Mount area is under strict Islamic control. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is on the southern side of the mount, facing Mecca. Well, if we believe in the, re we believe in the uh, rebuilding of the temple, so, uh, yeah, you have, a, you have a little bit of a problem there, uh, logistically, because you Dome of the Rock, rebuilding of the temple. Uh, Jerusalem and that particular area of the Temple Mount is also referred to as the Gate to Heaven. And uh, therefore, its uh, holiness to the Jewish people uh, should be understood. The history of Christianity revolves around the 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that reveal an upcoming Jewish Messiah who would be a savior of humanity. Messiah that would be born in Bethlehem, the Bible says. He would live in Galilee. He would teach in parables. He would be surrounded by a band of, uh, of evil men who would uh, crucify him. But his body wouldn't be left for decay in a grave. It would, it would, he would be resurrected. That's just a few. 
of more than 300 prophecies. For Christians, Jesus was the Messiah. He preached for about three years, and he picked 12 men with whom he worked most closely, the 12 disciples, or apostles. The apostles were really uh, um, what we would now describe as missionaries. They had uh, often many of the spiritual gifts. Their job was to preach the gospel, uh, make disciples, plant churches, and keep uh, advancing the kingdom of God uh, city by city, uh, region by region. The primary reason for Jesus' earthly life was to provide the way of salvation from sin through the ultimate sacrifice, his crucifixion on Calvary, followed by his resurrection. In the New Testament, there are multiple references that Jesus will someday return. It's interesting to me that the disciples that asked the question, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And that season is going to be uh, uh, foreshadowed by a whole series of events that are described in Matthew chapter 24, uh, Luke chapter 21, Mark 13, as well as throughout the Old and New Testament prophets. Islam developed from both Judaism and Christianity 640 years after Christ. Muhammad, the founder of Islam, is believed to have been born around 570 AD in the Arabian city of Mecca. Genealogically, it is claimed that he was a descendant of Abraham's first son, Ishmael. Muhammad was orphaned at an early age and brought up under the care of his uncle. He later worked mostly as a merchant and shepherd until he was 40. One night in the month of Ramadan in the year 610 AD, Muhammad declared that he received revelations from God and that he appointed him his last prophet and messenger on earth. Islam came as the third message from the God of Abraham after Judaism and Christianity and he felt that that was a way to demonstrate sort of an interfaith commonality of common origin that uh, our faiths uh, all came from that same fact and in fact Abraham the story of Abraham is the most revered story in our faith in Islam because that is our greatest holiday, Eid al-Adha, the holiday of the sacrifice. The pilgrimage to Mecca is done around the time at which we believe Abraham sacrificed uh, his son um, or was asked to sacrifice his son. According to Islamic history, Muhammad went into the cave of Hira to fast and pray as he did each year. And this particular year, as he was in the cave, this very powerful presence came over him. This was the beginning of the inspiration of the Islamic faith and the creation of the book now known as the Quran. Muslims understand the Quran to be the words of Allah. Now alternately, we need to understand that Muslims also adhere to a, a large body of scripture that they call the Hadith or the Sunnah, which is the record of everything that Muhammad did, said, forbid, or condoned. The Jews and Christians had effected important settlements throughout the Arabian Peninsula, establishing major trade and agricultural centers. Muhammad began to reach out to both Jewish and Christian leaders, and also to pagans and polyamorists in the region who were quicker to accept his teachings. Islam did not come to convert Christians and Jews, it came to the pagans of Arabia, that ultimately that narrative was a false narrative that was taken over by other tribes such as now the Wahhabis that uh, made Islam into a theopolitical movement. Muhammad believed Jews and Christians were indeed people of the book but they had lost a full understanding of the true revelations from God. There is the Meccan period and the Medinian period. Uh, in simple terms, during the Meccan period, Muhammad tried to use sugar to win converts. He tried to be very sweet and tolerant and accepting of Jews and Christians. In general, Christians showed no hostility to the new faith. However, the situation with the Jews was different. Many rabbis treated Muhammad in the same way in which they treated their pagan neighbors. He was simply an upstart in the realm of religions in the region. Since he was not Jewish, they rejected him as a messiah or messenger from God. His relations with many of the tribes in Medina became tense and eventually would lead to the slaughter of nearly every Jew in the Arabian Peninsula. He began to become very violent, very imperialistic, very demanding, very intolerant, extremely anti-Semitic during this period. During his lifetime, Muhammad led his army into a string of bloody battles, primarily against the Jews. He sieged a Jewish tribe in Medina, forcing them into exile, leaving behind their property in agricultural lands. He conquered the last Jewish tribe in Medina. But perhaps Muhammad's bloodiest battle was at Jewish Khaibar. Khaibar was the Jewish village where Muhammad slaughtered between seven to 900 Jewish men by cutting off their heads. It, it was the final destruction of the Jewish people in the Arabian Peninsula. 
This event is deeply etched in the radical Muslim memory. The Battle of Haibar was even used as motivation during the Gaza flotilla raid of May 31st, 2010. In the mainstream media, we saw the flotilla incident in Israel portrayed as a peace protest. What was not shown in most of the media were these protesters as they were chanting the song, Chaiba Chaiba O Yahud, which means, O Jews, remember Chaibar. Just as there are radical elements expanding globally, there are other movements trying to educate the world and send the message that not all the people of Islam are radical. Muslims like myself that want to reform and separate mosques and state are not going to reform the Ahmadinejads or the Wahhabis of the world. But remember, that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the Nidal Hassans, the radicals of the world, did not wake up one day radical after having gone to sleep moderate, peace-loving, constitutional Muslims. They radicalized over years and they slid down a slippery slope of political Islam, that they start with this concept that somehow Islam needs to be part of the Constitution, the theology needs to be mixed in government with Sharia, and then many of them keep getting worse and worse until they become supremacist and then militant. So the Ahmadijahs, the fascists, are I think military threats. The bigger threat and even I think a more concerning one is the ideological battle that many in the West don't want to deal with and say well Muslims want theocracy that's up to them. I think most Muslims don't want theocracy but need help to start to build institutions to counter political Islam. So yeah there's divisions of Sunnis and Shia those are sectarian divisions related to tribal histories of separations with uh, perceptions of what the, what the fourth Caliph Ali was and certain traditions in the practice. But at the end of the day, we all worship the same with the same book. We have the same perceptions, similar perceptions of the role of the Prophet Muhammad. And ultimately, if we want to get Islam into modernity for the majority of Muslims, the fact that the Prophet Muhammad was the head of state, the general of an army, and the messenger of God, that one person wore all those roles, we need to separate those in order for the concept of the supremacy of the Islamic State to go away. As long as those roles stay as one and we can't separate them out, you will ultimately always slide down to that radicalization and supremacism because everybody gets their rights from Islam rather than from God, which is what the West, I think, determined. There is a dramatic explosion of literature in the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim worlds focusing on prophecy. Something has sparked a global interest. One of the things that really intrigues me, I, I have to say, is how much interest there is in Bible prophecy. How much interest there is, not, I mean, yes, among lay people, but even among world leaders, among military leaders, among intelligence officials. Jews, Christians, and Muslims all believe in prophets and their messages to God's people. Very often you find that God speaks through the mouths of human beings. But I think this was that human link where God made his mission known to the prophets who then communicated uh, his feelings to the individuals. Muslims essentially believe that there are tens if not hundreds of thousands of prophets down throughout history and they would say that they believe in all of the various biblical prophets and they would actually include Jesus in that list. The easiest way to remember prophecy is it's history written in advance. It's a storm warning from the future and the prophet himself scripturally can't stop these events, he can't stop the storm any more than someone who works for the National Weather Service can stop a Hurricane Katrina or some other natural disaster. To some, prophecies can be chilling, especially when they center on the expectation of an individual who will herald the end of time and bring about the Kingdom of God on Earth. It's hard to believe this, but 2,500 years ago, Daniel is giving the king the instruction of the entire history of the human race from that point, 606 BC, until the end times. I sit with members of the evangelical community, and while we differ in our interpretation of the end of days, the eschatological view of time, there are many of us who feel this is a precursor to the messianic period. Jews, Muslims, and Christians all believe in an end times narrative. For Muslims, the end will be signaled by the creation of a caliph or return of an imam. The word caliph, the successor of Muhammad, applies only to Sunni Islam. 
Uh, in fact, there was a huge debate between Shiites and Sunnis who should be the successor. In Shiite Islam, they use a different word. They use the word Imam, uh, who is normally just a prayer leader but he's the leader of the entire Shiite community. While there is a division between Sunni and Shia surrounding the circumstances, both envision large Islamic empires. So it's the Caliph of Sunni Islam versus the Imam of Shiite Islam. Now, whether you are speaking about the uh, Sunni dream of recreating a Caliphate, which is the goal of the Muslim Brotherhood, or you are speaking about the Shiite hope to establish a um, Shiite-led Islamic world. What both have in common is erasing the state system in the Middle East that has been there since World War I. The goal of Islam, it was Muhammad who said, it has been given unto me to fight against the peoples, against the unbelievers, until there are none left in the earth that does not say, none has the right to be worshiped other than Allah. End times prophecies are expanded in the New Testament Christians point to specific scriptures, such as Matthew 24, where Jesus' disciples ask, what would be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus spoke of signs of the end of the age. Christ is clear, he's not gonna give away the store. He, you know, he says nobody knows the day or the hour, but he does seem to indicate quite clearly that he's gonna, uh, that we're gonna know the season of his return. When you see wars and rumors of wars, don't be troubled, but when you see one war or one country fight against another country joined by the kingdoms of the world followed by famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in many places at the same time. So there are four parts of that one sign and that's the trigger. We've been seeing so much uh, uh, turmoil in Libya uh, as we record this, it's, it's unclear exactly where that's going. Uh, in the Bible, uh, Libya is known as the nation of Put. We do know, and we would be expecting, that at some point uh, Libya becomes even more hostile to Israel than it even currently is under Gaddafi. One of the things that I would highlight specifically is the increase in earthquakes. The increase in significant earthquakes has gone from let's say one every hundred years to one every fifty years to one every several years to, to the point right now where we are having a significant earthquake in the earth sometimes a couple times a week. Economists are predicting the death of the dollar. The dramatic sell-off on Wall Street the states has the highest level of foreign debt in the world. And faith in the dollar as a global reserve currency is long gone. First, there is religious globalism. Second, there is economic globalism. And then third, there is governmental globalism. Haven't we seen in, in places where Coptic Christians, where just Christians who go to a church were attacked because they were Christians? Um, yeah, there, there are extremists there who feel that uh, we have to remove people who are different. For centuries, people have predicted the end of the world through a depression that nearly destroyed a generation, nations at war, rulers and dictators who tried to conquer the world. They all seemed to point to the signs that the world was coming to an end. While the evidence was compelling to many, there was always one major prophecy that was yet to be fulfilled. The rebirth of Israel in 1948 was the super sign. In other words, in other words there have been wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and persecution of believers for the last 2,000 years. What we haven't seen happen in the context of all the other prophecies coming true is we haven't seen until 62 years ago the rebirth of the state of Israel. That was prophesized. Uh, if you've seen pictures of uh, the War of Independence in 48, the Six Day War, soldiers who were somewhat secular, who were not necessarily religious, were weeping because they felt they had translated the words of the prophet. All three faiths point to prophecies that specifically mention Israel. 
In the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, the prophets said that the people of Israel would return to their homeland from the east, west, north, and south. And in the Quran, surah or chapter 17, it reads, And after him we said to the children of Israel, Dwell ye in the promised land. The United Nations would never have voted Israel as a state had it not been for Harry Truman who learned from his Sunday school teaching mother at, his, at her knee that if you ever get a chance to help Israel, you ought to help Israel. Israel, they realize we wouldn't be here if America wouldn't be here. The Jewish agency proclaimed independence on May 14, 1948 and named the country Israel. When the first Zionist Congress was held in Switzerland, 1897, someone wrote the following, Musegbo famous writer and poet, said, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. We come here today by the Rhine to create a document promoting the state of Israel so that one day Jews will cry no more. And I think that embodies the meaning of Israel in 1948, that finally the land and the people uh, were reunited with one another. On May 15, 1948, one day after its independence, Israel was attacked in what is known as the Arab-Israeli War. The fighting would continue until January 1949. What happened after the 1948 war, when Israel became independent, was that Israel was invaded by at least six Arab armies. Uh, in the area of Jerusalem, the Egyptians were in the south. There were Iraqi volunteers. There were also the um, Arab Legion of what was then called Transjordan, and today is Jordan. A prophecy that doesn't get much attention, but needs to get that attention, uh, particularly in the geopolitical world we live in right now, comes from the book of Joel, uh, chapter 3. And it indicates that God says that when history comes to an end, he is going to judge all the nations who have divided his land. And he's speaking specifically about the land of Israel. While it was a military victory for Israel, the United Nations declared the holy city of Jerusalem an internationalized city because of its religious importance. No city on the entire planet has been more fought over, uh, more prayed over, more uh, battled over than the city of Jerusalem, uh, which is sad because it actually means the city of peace. <laughs> For Jews, the city of Jerusalem is where David established it as the capital of Israel and home to the holiest sites. For Christians, the city is the place of Jesus' crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection and ascension, and prophecy says the place of his return. For Muslims, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which translates to farthest mosque, is in the city of Jerusalem. We initially, Muslims, prayed toward Jerusalem. There's also another story in the prophetic tradition that we believe that the prophet had a, a nighttime journey towards a mosque that uh, was in Jerusalem. Yeah, the city, Jerusalem is the rationale for the Islamic case that, that Israel is actually a Muslim state, notwithstanding that Jews were there for, you know, centuries before there was an Islam. From 1948 until 1967, Jews were banned from the heart of Jerusalem, from the old city of Jerusalem. They could not approach the Western Wall, which is the retaining wall of the Temple Mount. In June 1967, under the direction of General Moshe Dayan, the Israeli army took control of the old city of Jerusalem in what is known as the Six-Day War. For the first time in nearly 2,000 years, the Jews were in complete control of the city. We were worried, uh, but miraculously, you saw the hand of God and the hand of humans working together and suddenly, uh, six days, and all of a sudden, Jerusalem was ours. On June 7, 1967, Israeli troops moved into Jerusalem and stood at the western wall at the Temple Mount for prayer. Military Rabbi Shlomo Goren declared, We have taken the city of God. We are entering the messianic era for the Jewish people, and I promise to the Christian world that what we are responsible for, we will take care of. The war was a military disaster for the Arabs. The Israeli army took major territory in the war, including the West Bank of the Jordan River. The West Bank was home to more than 600,000 Arabs who came under Israeli administration. Their plight led to the formation of the terrorist organizations, the PLO, Hamas, and Hezbollah. But perhaps the Jews taking control of Jerusalem was the most significant loss for the Arabs. 
Jews, Christians, Muslims all point to Jerusalem as the epicenter of their faith and they all believe that that is where all uh, history will wind up. So there are those who believe the messianic period means an individual, a human descendant of the uh, David line will come will bring about a transformation in the world. Uh, there will be a resurrection of the dead. There will be the return of uh, justice. There will be true peace amongst all peoples. Um, the rebuilding of the temple uh, will take place. If Israel was ever pressured into making the tragic error of redividing Jerusalem, and Jerusalem went over to the side of a Palestinian authority, whether it's led by the Fatah movement or by Hamas or some combination thereof, religious freedom in Jerusalem would come to an end. So at the end of the day, I hope we have the political will in the West to stand by our friend Israel, our, our democratic friend. Uh, I know in, in my visit uh, to Israel, I saw a very normal democracy uh, that, uh, you know, we've had one major terror incident in 9-11 and then another incident at Fort Hood, but we've not lived through the level of terrorism that Israel has lived through, but yet it's been able to maintain its democracy. So it's important that we stand by it because it's been a canary in the coal mine in dealing with radical Islam. Uh, but I'll tell you, one of the things I hope people also realize is there's a vibrant Muslim community in, in Israel. There are Islamic schools, they have Sharia courts that are functional, that separate mosque and state, but yet allow Muslims to have certain rights to their own desires to have a legal system. So. Um, that's part of the Israeli fabric. So I think that that's an example that the problem is not with Muslims necessarily or with Islam, it's with a large theopolitical movement that dominates Iranian government, that dominates movements in some movements in Egypt and Saudi Arabia. So it's a huge problem within the Muslim communities, but it can be resolved from within.